Okay, so uh, let me just explain that these cases are presented in the format of board questions. So this would be useful as a board review. So the, the rules in, in, in these questions is that there's only one right answer. There, there's never more than one right answer. And read the stem carefully if the, it hardly ever says what is the mechanism because sometimes you don't know for sure what the mechanism is. And very often the questions are worded such that it says, what's the most likely mechanism? So you may think of some mechanism that's not even listed. For, for example, a concealed notofascicular bypass tract that allows you to reset a uh, AV node reentry with a hysterfractory PVC. It doesn't matter. If that's not one of the listed options, don't worry about it. Just forget about it and, work, and think about the four options that are presented to you. So figure one shows a spontaneous onset of an SVT with a cycle length of 350 milliseconds. Figure two shows spontaneous termination of the SVT. And which one of the following is the most likely mechanism? So uh, let's go to the next one. Um, you know, Nishan, I can't, uh, this hole is uh, blocking. Oh, you Actually, can move, you can move it out of the way. And, and we don't see the pole on your, on, you know, what's visible on your screen. We don't actually see, we just see the slide. So you can move that out of the way and then advance. All right. So here's uh, the first tracing. This shows the onset. So take a look at that for a little while. And that's the onset, you'll see it again. This is the spontaneous termination. So here's the onset. We'll just uh, leave it on here for a while. Sean, I don't need to see uh, any video from elsewhere, right? No. I can minimize this because it's in the way. Yeah, you can get rid of the video on your screen so you could just see the slides. Okay, yeah. Looks like um, the votes are for AVNRT here. But there's only three, three people who voted. Uh -oh. True. You guys want to re-vote here? See if we can get a few more answers. The, the poll is not blocking view of the tracing, is it? No, we just see your screen. Even though the poll looks like it's in the way on your screen, we, right, don't, right. we don't see it. Good. So, mm -hmm. so this is the spontaneous termination. I'm going to uh, close close this poll on my screen because it keeps getting in my way. I move it and then it comes back to the center. All right, so you uh, what's that red stuff on? Hmm. So looks like um, majority of people voted for AVNRT here. Does anyone want to unmute and um, go through the tracings with Dr. Maradi? If not, I'll unmute people. All right, well, let's, let's discuss it. So what we see here is a QRS that's initially has right bundle branch block aberration. And um, there's no atrial depolarization immediately in front of it. So 
you can certainly rule out an atrial tachycardia very easily. You can rule out orthodromic AV reciprocating tachycardia very easily because the atrial depolarization is simultaneous with the QRS, which is impossible in ORT. So the differential is down to AVNRT or an automatic junctional tachycardia. So this is certainly compatible with an automatic junctional tachycardia because it just starts with a premature junctional depolarization and continues. There's not a critical AH there. I mean, there's no, there's no immediate AH in front of it, but you might think, well, maybe it's a double fire. Down fast, down slow, up fast, and then down slow, and it gets perpetuated. So we can't really uh, distinguish those two based on, on the uh, initiation. I think the key is the termination. Because first of all, when this tachycardia terminates, it terminates with a QRS. There's no VA conduction. Now, if it's a junctional tachycardia, that'd be awfully coincidental that the first QRS that has VA block without any VA block in front of it um, is simultaneous with termination. So AVNRT indeed is the, is the most likely correct answer. So uh, should we ask, are there any questions about what I've said, Nishan? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, either send it through the chat and I can ask it, or if you want to unmute and ask, you can do that now. Otherwise we can move on to the next case. All right, so we'll move on then. What's the most likely explanation for widening of the QRS during atrial pacing? Um, the tracing I'm gonna show you in a minute. An AV accessory pathway with decremental properties, an atrial fascicular bypass tract, nodoventricular bypass tract, or rate dependent left bundle. So <clears throat> here is the tracing at uh, 100 paper speed. And this is the transition from narrow to wide. And then I'm going to show you uh, the same thing at 200 paper speed. So this is where you want to focus. This is the transition. So we'll just focus on this tracing. So Dr. Murati, there was a question that came through maybe on the last tracing. And Ahmed, you can unmute yourself if, you, if I'm not asking it correctly, but um, it looks like you're asking if you have JET, will you always have one-to-one -one conduction? I think that's the question. The answer is no, definitely not. And it doesn't even have to be your regular tachycardia. Sometimes it's mistaken to be atrial fibrillation. Um, because the irregular pattern of uh, P waves um, might mimic to someone who is not an arrhythmia specialist, it might mimic atrial fibrillation. Uh, but you can have, the only thing that you always have is <clears throat> a regular, or I mean, a, 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 a tachycardia that involves the AV junction, in other words, there's a hiss. You can have anagrade block or you, and very often retrograde block. And um, the, the anagrade block, the only way you can diagnose it obviously is with a, uh, with a uh, an e during an EP study with a hiss catheter in place. But you, can, you might see a, a occasional hiss that doesn't go down uh, the lower counter pathway or the, the part of the hiss below the, uh, below where this is being recorded. But more often it's a VA block. And so you can have wanky block, you can have two to one VA block. There's no predictable pattern.
All right, so here we are back to this one. A few more votes coming in here. So it looks like a bit of a split there between uh, atrofascicular and notoventricular. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's just look at the choices again. An AV accessory pathway with decremental properties, atrofascicular, noto, rate dependent. So obviously rate dependent left bundle is uh, clearly not the right answer because the HIS is not in front of the QRS. So that's an easy one. Now, how do we know that the right answer is in nature fascicular? The, the key observation is that when it becomes wide, there is reversal of the his activation sequence from proximal distal to distal proximal. Now, if it was an AV accessory pathway with decremental properties, or if it was a nodoventricular with um, the hiss at the onset of the QRS, that would mean that there was anagrade conduction down the, that, that would necessitate anterograde conduction down the hiss and uh, anagrade conduction down either the nodoventricular or the, um, or the, uh, did I, did I say it was a note? I did say it was a nature of fascicular, right? Yeah, I must have. Yes, you did. Yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> so if it's uh, that, that, in other words, the atrial fascicular is the only one, the only possible explanation for pre-excitation with a hiss at the onset of the QRS that has a retrograde sequence. So, you know, let's say it's a nodoventricular. So it's going to get down to the AV node, and then there's going to be two wave fronts. One wave front is going down the His, the other wave front is going down the nodoventricular. Well, there's no way the nodoventricular is going to get there in time to go up the His when the His has already been engaged in the anagrade direction from the AV node. And, um, and the same thing with uh, with an accessory pathway. It would have you'd have to say that there's um, simultaneous conduction down the hiss and down the pathway, uh, if it, because it's not antidromic tachycardia where the hiss is after it. This is atrial atrial pacing. So so that's that's the long and short of it. That uh, the only the only uh, possible explanation for the retrograde activation sequence in the hiss is an atrial fascicle. Questions? Nothing uh, through the chat here. Oh. Can I have a question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question regarding the atriofascular tachycardia. Is it possible to have atriofascular tachycardia that cannot be, I mean, if you, during sinus rhythm, if you do atrial pacing from wherever, whether the appendage or uh, around the tricuspid annulus and you cannot get pre-excited taker. Is it possible to have such type of, I mean, that it cannot be when you pace from the atrium, you cannot get pre-excited. You cannot get white QRS, white QRS complex. Is it poss oh, possible no, to have do. such a case? An, an no, an antidromic atrial fascicular has the classic antidromic tachycardia response to a premature atrial deposition that's falling where the node would be refractory. It does pull in 
the next QRS and reset the tachycardia. So it does pull in, it does, it does pull in the, the next QRS, but that's not enough to say it's an active participant. It also has to reset the tachycardia. That's the distinction with a nodoventricular. A nodoventricular antidromic nodoventricular will not respond to a PAC, to a premature atrial depolarization. Because the node, it has to get through the node to get to the path to the, get to the bypass tract of its node of the and it can't. Thank you very much. I mean, if you have a typical type of atrial tachycardia, but during atrial pacing, during sinus rhythm, is it possible to have, you can't have a wide chorus during atrial pacing? I mean, during sinus rhythm, not during entrainment or, or APC. Well, this is an example of it. This uh -huh. is atrial pacing with a narrow QRS. And then once you get enough delay in the AV node, it jumps to the atrial fascicular and goes up the his. Here it's going down the his. So sure. Thank you. I mean, look, look at this uh, slower speed. All these are now are normal narrow QRSs with normal HV interval. So it's only, and there's a gradual increase. You know, you can see a decremental conduction in the AV node. The AH is getting progressively longer. And then at some point, um, <clears throat> it blocks in the node and goes down the atrial fissicular and up the hips. So does that answer your question? I think he was wondering exactly. if there's ever a case where you never see with atrial pacing, you never see a wide QRS, or will you always see it if there's an atrial fascicular present? A manifest atrial fascicular? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Up to the effective refractory period, I did from the appendage from all over the tricuspid annulus down to the effective refractory period, but couldn't uh, have wide QRS while it was taken earlier. So is there some, uh, was there something wrong? Or, I mean, sometimes you have Atrial fascicular tachycardia, but you cannot get wide chorus from pacing all around the tricuspid annulus or the appendage. Did, but you were, hmm, that's interesting. But you did have antidromic tachycardia? I did, absolutely, I did, yes. And you're, o sure, almost it was, less you're, you're sure it was an atrial fascicular? Almost, yes, almost sure. Almost? But sure. The almost sure. But the problem was I couldn't induce. I need That's the tough one to explain. If you're blocking in the node and still not seeing any pre excitation, yes. um, I don't know. <laughs> then it makes me think it's a nodoventricular, a nodoventricular. I read about a subtle type of atrial fascicular tachycardia, but not sure actually. There is one report about subtle type. You, cannot get, you can get atrial fascicular tachycardia, but when you pace during sense with them, down to the ERP, you couldn't get the white course. Well, you sure down it, wait a minute, down all right, ERP, you're talking about A1, A2? Or during rapid atrial pace? Uh, no, no, atrial ERP. What? Da down to the atrial ERP. Not when what you are down what to about the atrial ERP. What about incremental AV pace, atrial pacing? Not not the ERP with, the ERP. with A1, A2, but when you uh -huh. you get the block cycle length of the AV node, you still there was still no pre excitation. No pre excitation. I mean, if that's no. the case, I don't know how to explain it. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Should we move on, Sean? Yes. Yeah, sure. All righty. So here we are. What's the most likely the most likely mechanism of the tachycardia that has a cycle length of 250 milliseconds shown in the tracing? AV node reentry, AT, ORT, or an automatic junctional tachycardia. And here we are. Starts out with a right bundle and it becomes narrow.
So it looks like most chose orth orthodromic AVRT, 70% and 30% for AVNRT. Hmm. Okay. So I think everyone who chose AVNRT did not appreciate the fact that the high RA precedes the A, the septal A and the his bundle electrogram. So that excludes with certainty AV node entry and AJT. So it's down to AT or orthodromic reciprocating tachycardia. So let's look at that. So you have, if it's ORT, then it's going to be a right sided pathway because the high RA is preceding the septal A. Very unlikely you would see that with a left free wall pathway or even a septal pathway. So if it's a right sided pathway with a right bundle branch block, the VA interval measured from the onset of the QRS to the A and whatever, as long as you measure the same A, it doesn't matter which, which one, but the cleaner, Cleanest A is in the high RA. So if, um, if you put your calipers um, to, in such a way that you can estimate this interval, you'll see it's exactly the same over here. Now, if it was a right-sided pathway, this, should be, this VA should be longer than this VA, but it's not. So that makes <clears throat> an AT much more likely than ORT. And um, that's, uh, that's what it was, it wasn't AT. All right, so it's, it's always good to look at all the, all the electrograms, the surface ECGs and sequence and then intracardiacs. And um, <clears throat> I always stress to my fellows that if you're going to want to consider AV node entry, then you have to have an inverted P wave in V2 and V3. And you do. You have that here. <laughs> but what you don't have, what you do, what you also have is a high RA that's preceding the septal A. So it just can't be. This takes precedence, obviously, the the intracardiac atrial activation sequence takes precedence over the surface P waves. So this is the negative, the inverted P waves in two and three are consistent, but not diagnostic of AV node entry. They're non-specific, in other words. Nishant, do you, did you get any questions? Uh, nothing through the chat at this point. Okay. All right, we'll move on then. Uh, tachycardia with a variable psych length of 290 to 390 milliseconds was induced in the EP lab. Most likely mechanisms, AT, AVNRT, automatic junctional, or ORT, orthotromic AV reentry. So here we are.
looks like most went for ORT Good. and a couple uh, choices for AVNRT and ATEC. Yeah. All right. So um, as I had just said on the prior case that <clears throat> you can rule out AVNRT and automatic junctional tachycardia if the high IRA precedes the septal ray. So those two are out. Um, so it's down to AT or ORT. And what's the useful diagnostic observation is that there's a great deal of variability in the tachycardia cycle length. And it's pretty clear that the delta HH is preceding the delta AA, which would not be the case if it was an atrial tach. So it is ORT using the right side of accessory pathway. Patient might have uh, more than one AV nodal pathway, maybe it jumps from fast to slow, uh, which is often the reason for marked uh, changes in cycle length during ORT. All right, so I think this one should be pretty straightforward. Most people got it right, so should we move on, Sean? Yeah. Good. Okay, two tracings show the induction of a non-sustained SVT. The S1, S2 copper intervals were 250 and 260 milliseconds in the two tracings. This is AT, most likely is it AT, typical avian RT, atypical avian RT, or ORT using a concealed accessory pathway. Here is the first tracing with a coupling interval A182 or S1, S2 coupling interval of 250 milliseconds. And here's the non-sustained tachycardia. By the way, uh, Nishant, do you, does my, uh, my pointer show up? On? Yeah, we can see your mouse moving there. Okay, good. So this is the coupling interval of 250, and we get this induction of a non-sustained SVT, and then a second induction with a coupling interval of 260 milliseconds. This is the shorter coupling interval. This is the longer, slightly longer coupling interval. Uh, looks like um, a split between atrial tech, atypical avian RT, 44%, and then one vote for ORT. Okay, so ORT is definitely ruled out very quickly by the fact that when there was AV block with S2, this didn't go down the node. It in, the tachycardia was nevertheless induced. So that's impossible. You have to have conduction down of the ventricle before you can go up an accessory pathway. So it's definitely an auto RT. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about avian RT or atypical avian RT. The um, 
first of all, notice that the P wave is um, a little bit negative in lead two, but initially positive in lead three, and then becomes negative. And these IRA his uh, receptor rays are almost uh, simultaneous. Um, now, this is not a, there's a, the his catheter is out of position because we don't have a good his recording. So I don't know how much, you don't know for sure where this A is being recorded, but nevertheless, you do know for sure that you don't have the typical inverted P waves in the inferior leads. So AVNRT would be very unlikely uh, if these were inverted consistent with AVNRT, then you could say that it was an induction with lower column pathway block. It went down one pathway, blocked into lower column pathway, so there's no QRS, and went up the other pathway. So if that was the case, then it would look more like atypical AV node entry than a typical AV node entry. Um, but when you have lower common pathway block, it, it kind of throws everything off because you don't know how, whether this is truly the, uh, maybe there's a delay in the upper, upper common pathway also or the lower common pathway. So I, I would say if it was AVNRT, it's more likely atypical, but you wouldn't know for sure. But in any case, it's up to me in atrial tachycardia because the induction of the tachycardia is independent of whether or not there is conduction through the AV node. And uh, that's the hallmark of an AT that sets it apart. The atrium obviously doesn't care what the AV node is doing. It only cares what's happening in the atrium. So this S1, S2 interval induced AT, and this one did too, regardless of what was going on in the HIS, in the AV node. All right, any uh, questions? Nothing on the chat here. If anyone has a question, you can unmute and ask. Okay. All right, so now we have an SVT induced with a single atrial extra stimulus. Which one of the following is the most likely mechanism? Right atrial tack, a typical AV node entry, ORT using, utilizing an antraceptal, or ORT utilizing the right free wall. Hmm. 
looks like 88% for a right yeah. free wall and yeah. uh, one vote for anteroseptal. Okay, this is a fairly uh, common mechanism of auto termination of ORT. You start out with um, right bundle branch block, with a bundle branch block, and as soon as you lose the bundle branch block, the, um, the interval gets a lot shorter and blocks in the AV node. So this is consistent. It's your right bundle. It's this marked uh, change. Uh, I think it was 60 milliseconds, um, is what I recall. It gets 60 milliseconds shorter. So that's consistent with a right free wall. And antraceptal also would get sh uh, shorter if you lose a right bundle, but that's usually by uh, less than 30 milliseconds, often less than 20, maybe in the range of 15, 20 milliseconds. When it's greater than 30, that uh, tells you there's a right free wall pathway. Um, you know that it's not uh, AT because it'd be awfully coincidental the first time you lose the rate dependent aberration is the first time you get a PAC that terminates in atrial tachycardia. That'd be a real stretch. <laughs> so most people got it right. Okay. So the key, the, the way it, we know it's not an antraceptal is because the magnitude of the change in VA time with the loss of the bundle branch block. A uh, tachycard that has a cycle length of 300 milliseconds is terminated by RV pacing at a cycle length of 240. This tachycard is most likely right atrial tach, a septal atrial tach, a typical AV node reentry, or ORT utilizing the right sided accessory pathway. So it looks like 80% for right-sided accessory pathway and a couple votes for atrial tach and atypical AVNRT. Okay, great. Just for the benefit of the 20% who didn't get it right, the first um, paste complex that clearly pulls in the A is this one, and there's clearly fusion. So if there's fusion, that means that there had to be simultaneous um, depolarization. That means that the Hiss was refractory because you can't get fusion with a paste complex unless you have conduction through the Hiss. So um, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> and if there was conduction down the Hiss, then it can't be conduction up the node. So this, and anyway, this is um, again, 
eccentric activation IRA right in front, way in front of the septal ring. So this is ORT. It's, uh, it's not AT with a, um, a bystander tachycardia, a bystander accessory pathway. I don't think that was a choice. No, it wasn't a choice. But it'd be very coincidental that the activation sequence would be exactly the same during deep tracing as you're in tachycardia. Now, granted, uh, we don't have a CS catheter. All we have is higher A and septal A. But even you would, you would have to say it was a, a, um, a right-sided AT that was very close to the atrial insertion of the accessory pathway. So um, I don't think we need to dwell on that one. All right, atrial fascicular, notoventricular, fascicular-ventricular, decremental AV, or atrial nodal. Which type of bypass tract is this? Kind of a scattered result there. Yeah, okay. So the reason that it is the right answer is a fascicular ventricular is because this is the only type of bypass tract on this list where the proximal insertion is below the AV node. And the key observation is that despite a huge change in AH interval, the HV is constant. It was 15 milliseconds in front of the QRS with the very short AH and with a very long AH. So that tells us the fact that there's not, that there's exactly the same, exactly the same degree of fusion in these two complexes in the face of a markedly longer AH interval tells us that this bypass tract is arising below the AV node. And um, that's why it's his, his ventricular. All right, so I think that'll be our last case, Nishant. Uh, Maybe. There was um, there was a question here. If you were mapping earliest V for a fasciculoventricular, uh, where would you find it? Is it anterior to the His? No, you find it. <laughs> well, first of all, there's no reason in the world for anyone to map a fasciculoventricular because they are not clinically significant. It's a cosmetic defect that has no no business being <laughs> mapped or or uh, it shouldn't no one should try to ablate these things um, you might want to take it on as a challenge but you're there's no reason to whatsoever so um, 
the, the insertion, if you do a lot of mapping, you usually see the insertion somewhere around the, uh, the, his, the a dist more distal portion of the um, Purkinje system, somewhere around the right bundle, the lower septum, somewhere around there. But uh, the, the um, but like I say, I, I don't know why the person is asking that question, Nishant. We shouldn't be mapping or blading these things. Fred, I feel like that's uh, a traditional teaching. Let oh, me Fred. Uh, interrupt real quickly. I, I recall that your practice was always to skip town at the beginning of July when the new fellows started, but you seem to be in town. Or is that because of COVID or you're? No, you are mixing me up with yeah. Hakan Oral, who, oh. <laughs> who took over uh, as uh, head of the EP section. About, it's been probably 10 years now. And uh, he has traditionally taken his three weeks of visiting home in Turkey in, um, in, July. <laughs> in July, very <laughs> conveniently. But right, because of uh, the traveler, uh, he's stuck here with the rest of us. So. Uh. Good, I'm glad you're, you're around. I do have a question just to, since the fellows are all new and things have changed so much over the last few years, all these cases you showed were with three catheters and no 3D mapping. Now, over time, I started using a 3D mapping system for all SVT cases, even AV node reentry. Uh, I'm kind of curious if you've jumped on that at all. But then beyond that, in the last few years, all these high density mapping systems have become very, Interesting, and people I see now are using for every accessory pathway a pent array or an HD grid. But what, what's your take on all the all this technology for standard SVT cases? I think it's a waste of time and a waste of money for simple cases like that. Uh, in fact, I never have felt the need to use it when we have uh, a post um, a post AF ablation um, atypical flutter. Uh, <laughs> I know from personal experience that it takes me less than five or minutes to pinpoint where I should be ablating just by simply by entrainment mapping. Whereas my colleagues who are using uh, high density mapping systems or activation sequences, um, that <laughs> they might 20, 30 minutes later still be trying to figure it out. So. I don't, I don't, I think that's overkill. Now I have to say that I do use the simple uh, Cardo, the 3D uh, electroanatomical mapping. I don't create a map of the heart, but it's very useful as a, uh, for non-fluoroscopic catheter manipulation. And it is useful to mark the, um, <clears throat> the successful ablation site, uh, particularly whether it's a slow pathway or or an accessory pathway, just in case the catheter moves. And then you can get it back. Uh, that's the problem with fluoroscopy. You, you don't really, you can't precisely reposition the catheter where it initially was. And the pathway may have disappeared, so you can't use uh, activation mapping anymore for the pathway. So I, I do use it um, for, for um, all my SVT cases now. Thanks. Can I ask you another question along those lines? Um, there have been a few questions from prior lectures about retrograde versus transeptal approaches for accessory pathways. Do you have a preferred method or does it? Oh, matter? yes, I do. Um, until I learned how to do the transeptal um, puncture, um, I, I, I used the retrograde approach because that was the only approach I could, I felt comfortable with. And we eventually always got it, but it takes a lot more time. So it's a lot more difficult to, from a technical point of view, but the big advantage of it is that once you get it in place, it stays there. It doesn't move because it has to be wedged in between the, uh, the muscle and the valve. And uh, you have uh, a lot of, um, the papillary uh, structures, the trabeculae uh, below the tricuspid valve. So you can't, uh, when you're doing a transeptal approach, you can put the catheter on the atrial side of the annulus and slide it along there. With the, um, with the retrograde approach, you, 
if you're not, you, you manipulate the catheter in such a way that you're going to get it into the general area, let's say left uh, lateral mitral annulus. But if it doesn't go to the right place and you want to move it a little bit this way, a little bit that way, you have to pull it out and try to re-advance it to the right spot. You, you, you can't, there's very little uh, capability of, of uh, changing the position of the catheter once you're in a particular spot. You have to just pull it out and re-approach that, that area. So I, I always, and it's rare now with the transeptal, when we started, when I started doing a lot of AF cases, then I learned, you know, I became very comfortable with the transeptal. So, um, and then the other advantage is that they can go home more quickly with the uh, femoral artery approach, retrograde aortic approach. Uh, it's more of a six or seven hour recovery.